to divorce the climate crisis from racism is just, it's just not possible. You're a medical student, but you're also a climate campaigner with loads of experience kind of campaigning with direct action groups. Um, Extinction Rebellion, etc. Um, yeah. And you run an Instagram account with loads of amazing stuff about sustainable fashion on there. And you run the Yikes podcast as well, which is really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to just kind of tell me a little bit about yourself and all of these things that you do? Yeah, sure. So um, I co-host a podcast called The Yikes Podcast, which is all about the things in the world that can make us yikes. So things that can be really overwhelming and that we want to run away from. Um, But instead, we want to encourage people to lean into that kind of discomfort and that yikes feeling and Mm. instead move towards action. Um, So we talk about things from refugee rights to climate justice. Well, everything's from a climate justice lens um, and an anti-racist lens, and intersectional lens. Um, Mm. We just talk about some topical things that are going on, but also some kind of like wider structural issues and try and encourage people to get involved in organizing because we think Mm. that activism and organizing is what causes change. The other thing you kind of talk about quite a lot and that has been really prescient in the last year is the connection between racial inequality and the climate movement and the importance of like fighting climate change and why those two things are connected kind of globally and um, I was wondering if you could kind of explain the connection a little bit there. The climate crisis itself as an issue um, is a product of all the systems that exist in this world. So all the systems that have created the world as it is today, um, if we think about colonialism, that's something that's had played a huge role in the world yeah. that we see today. Um, and colonialism was based on this idea of superiority of, of white people over people of color. It was also built on this idea of it being extractive. So extracting resources and extracting commodities from other lands at yeah. the expense of different people and different communities. And the climate crisis that we see today um, is a direct result of colonialism and the legacy that that left, um, but also how neo-colonialism, so that's new colonialism today, mm. is happening in extractive industries like the fossil fuel industry, how they will do the same thing that settler colonialists did. They'll go into nations, extract resources, harm the people that are there for the benefit of, of majority white people in quote unquote Western countries. Um, yeah. And that that's that's the reason why I, I it's it's frustrating I think sometimes when people are like what is the connection because yeah. you can't it's not even just connection intersection it's at the core and the root of yeah. of this crisis to divorce the climate crisis from racism is just it's just not possible yeah yeah it's like really fundamental and you talk a bit about that in the links to the fashion industry as well quite a lot mm-hmm. don't you in your in your podcast I think that um, fashion is a really is, is also a key place where um, we see kind of neo-colonialist attitudes coming to the fore mm. again, because um, we talk a lot about fashion being something that's really empowering for me as an individual, maybe. So I can wear clothes that make me feel great and it can be empowering and it can feel really good. But mm. if it's just me that's being empowered as someone who's wearing the clothes, but the person who made those clothes aren't empowered, then I- is that true empowerment? If the person who made the clothes was was harmed in the process, if they were discriminated against, if they weren't paid a living wage, if they were put in harm's way, then c- can that really be true empowerment? And I think that fashion is a really good way in which we can make the connection between how we live and how the rest of the world lives and how we should be a global community and instead we shouldn't um ignore supply chains and ignore how people who make our make the things that give us joy in this world and um, how they mm. are also treated um, yeah. and ways that um we can do that is definitely campaigning um and putting pressure on these fast fashion companies and any company that makes clothes or anything actually constantly asking the question demanding transparency and demanding accountability is what will kind of drive change and we'll see a bit of a change there. Yeah, I guess on that note, if if you are kind of a 15 year old or 16 year old who's interested in climate change activism in particular, is there anything you'd kind of recommend they do in terms of where they, if, how they could get started? Um, yeah, I would, I'd really just say join a group. And I really want people to know that um, whoever you are, you have uh, like skills that are needed for movement. Um, I kind of think of it as like, if you're running an event, you need a lot of people. I use this analogy a lot, but if you're mm-hmm. running an event, you need a lot of different people. You don't just need people who are going to do the emceeing and and be on the microphone and giving um, speeches or organizing things. You also need people who are going to have the time to put up posters or even print posters or design posters or just be there for emotional support for people who are stressed out or there yeah. are loads of different roles and um, anyone who's listening, watching this, um, 
you will have a skill that's in, that's important and that is essential for movements and um please just join because we need as many people as possible <laughs>